carnival pitches stood, like melting wax dummies, eyes staring blindly, not talking, all down the line. Two customers had passed through an hour before. Those two lonely people were now on the roller coaster, screaming murderously as it plummeted down the blazing night around one emptiness after another. Amy moved slowly across the strand, a few worn wooden hoopla rings sticking to her wet hands. She stopped behind the ticket booth that fronted the mirror maze. She saw herself grossly misrepresented in three rippled mirrors outside the maze. A thousand tired replicas of herself dissolved in the corridor beyond, hot images among so much clear coolness. She stepped inside the ticket booth and stood looking a long while at Ralph Banghart's thin neck. He clenched an unlit cigar between his long, uneven yellow teeth as he laid out a battered game of solitaire on the ticket shelf. When the roller coaster wailed and fell in its terrible avalanche again, she was reminded to speak. What kind of people go up in roller coasters? Ralph Banghart worked his cigar a full thirty seconds. People want to die. That roller coaster's the handiest thing to dying there is. He sat listening to this faint sound of rifle shots from the shooting gallery. This whole damn carny business crazy. For instance, that dwarf. You see him? Every night pays his dime. Runs in the mirror maze all the way back through to Screwy Louie's room. You should see this little runt head back there. My God. Oh, yes, said Amy, remembering. I always wonder what it's like to be a dwarf. I always feel sorry when I see him. I could play him like an accordion. Don't say that. My Lord, Ralph patted her thigh with a free hand. The way you carry on about guys you never even met. He shook his head and chuckled. Him and his secret. Only he don't know I know, see? Boy, howdy. It's a hot night. She twitched the large wooden hoops nervously on her damp fingers. Don't change the subject. He'll be here, rain or shine. Amy shifted her weight. Ralph seized her elbow. Hey, you went mad. You want to see that dwarf, don't you? Shh, Ralph turned. Here he comes now. The dwarf's hand, hairy and dark, appeared all by itself, reaching up into the booth window with a silver dime. An invisible person called O'Nell in a high child's voice. Involuntarily, Amy bent forward. The dwarf looked up at her, resembling nothing more than a dark-eyed, dark-haired, ugly man who had been locked in a wine press, squeezed and wadded down, fold on fold agony on agony, until a bleached, outraged mass is left. The face bloated shapelessly, a face you know must stare wide-eyed and awake at two and three and four o'clock in the morning, lying flat in bed, only the body asleep. Ralph tore a yellow ticket in half. One! The dwarf, as if frightened by an approaching storm, pulled his black coat lapels tightly about his throat and waddled swiftly. A moment later, ten thousand lost and wandering dwarfs wriggled beneath the mirror flats like frantic dark beetles and vanished. Quick! Ralph squeezed Amy along a dark passage behind the mirrors. She felt him pat her all the way back through the tunnel to a thin partition with a peak hole. This is rich, he chuckled. Go on, look! Amy hesitated, then put her face to the partition. You see him? Ralph whispered. Amy felt her heart beating. A full minute passed. There stood the dwarf in the middle of the small blue room. His eyes were shut. He wasn't ready to open them yet. Now, now he opened his eyelids and looked at a large mirror set before him. And what he saw in the mirror made him smile. He winked, he pirouetted, he stood sideways, he waved, he bowed, he did a little clumsy dance, and the mirror repeated each motion with long, thin arms, with a tall, tall body, with a huge wink and an enormous repetition of the dance, ending in a gigantic bow. Every night, same thing, whispered Ralph in Amy's ear. 
ain't that rich. Amy turned her head and looked at Ralph steadily out of her motionless face for a long time, and she said nothing. Then, as if she could not help herself, she moved her head slowly and very slowly back to stare once more through the opening. She held her breath. She felt her eyes begin to water. Ralph nudged her, whispering, Hey, what's the little gink doing now? They were drinking coffee and not looking at each other in the ticket booth half an hour later, when the dwarf came out of the mirrors. He took his hat off and started to approach the booth when he saw Amy and hurried away. He wanted something, said Amy. Yeah, Ralph squashed out a cigarette idly. I know what, too. But he hasn't got the nerve to ask. One night, in this squeaky little voice, he says, I bet those mirrors are expensive. Well, I played dumb. I said, yeah, they were. He sort of looked at me, waiting, and when I didn't say any more, he went home. But next night, he said, I bet those mirrors cost fifty, a hundred bucks. I bet they do, I said. I laid me out a hand of solitaire. Ralph, she said. He glanced up. Why you look at me that way? Ralph, she said. Why don't you sell him one of your extra ones? Look, Amy, do I tell you how to run your hoop circus? How much do those mirrors cost? I can get them second hand for thirty-five bucks. Why don't you tell him where he can buy one, then? Amy, you're not smart. He laid his hand on her knee. She moved her knee away. Even if I told him where to go, you think he'd buy one? Not on your life. And why? He's self-conscious. Why, if he even knew I knew he was flirting around in front of that mirror in screwy Louis's room, he'd never come back. He plays like he's going through the maze to get lost, like everybody else. Pretends like he don't care about that special room. Always waits for business to turn bad, late nights, so he has that room to himself. What he does for entertainment on nights when business is good, God knows. No, sir. He wouldn't dare go by a mirror anywhere. He ain't got no friends. And even if he did, he couldn't ask him to buy him a thing like that. Pride. By God, pride. Only reason he even mentioned it to me is I'm practically the only guy he knows. Besides, look at him. He ain't got enough to buy a mirror like those. He might be saving up. But where in hell in the world today can a dwarf work? Dime a dozen. Drug on the market, outside of circuses. I feel awful. I feel sad. Amy sat staring at the empty boardwalk. Where does he live? Fly trap down on the waterfront. The Gangi's arms. Why? I'm madly in love with him, if you must know. He grimmed around his cigar. Amy, he said, you and your very funny jokes. A warm night. A hot morning and a blazing noon. The sea was a sheet of burning tinsel and glass. Amy came walking in the locked-up carnival alleys out over the warm sea, keeping in the shade half a dozen sun-bleached magazines under her arm. She opened the flaking door and called into hot darkness. Ralph! She picked her way through the black hall, behind the mirrors, her heels tacking the wooden floor. Ralph? Someone stirred sluggishly on the canvas cot. Amy? He sat up and screwed a dim light bulb into the dressing table socket. He squinted at her, half blinded. Hey, you look like the cat that swallowed a canary. Ralph? I came about the midget. Dwarf, Amy, honey, dwarf. A midget is in the cells, born that way. A dwarf is in the glands. Ralph, I just found out the most wonderful thing about him. Honest to God, he said, to his hands holding them out as witnesses to his disbelief. This woman, who in hell gives two cents for some ugly little Ralph? She held out the magazines, her eyes shining. He's a writer. Think of that. It's a pretty hot day for thinking. 
He lay back and examined her, smiling faintly. I just happened to pass the Ganges Arms and saw Mr. Greeley, the manager. He says the typewriter runs all night in Mr. Big's room. Is that his name? Ralph began to roar with laughter. Writes just enough pulp detective stories to live. I found one of his stories in the second-hand magazine place. And Ralph, guess what? I'm tired, Amy. This little guy's got a soul as big as all outdoors. He's got everything in his head. Why ain't he writing for the big magazines then, I ask you? Because maybe he's afraid. Maybe he doesn't know he can do it. That happens. People don't believe in themselves. But if he only tried, I bet he could sell stories anywhere in the world. Why ain't he rich, I wonder? Maybe because ideas come slow, because he's down in the dumps. Who wouldn't be? So small that way? I bet it's hard to think of anything except being so small and living in a one-room cheap apartment. Hell, snorted Ralph. You talk like Florence Nightingale's grandma. She held up the magazine. I'll read you part of his crime story. It's got all the guns and tough people, but it's told by a dwarf. I bet the editors never guessed the author knew what he was writing about. Oh, please don't sit there like that, Ralph. Listen. And she began to read out loud. I'm a dwarf, and I'm a murderer. The two things cannot be separated. One is the cause of the other. The man I murdered used to stop me on the street when I was 21, pick me up in his arms, kiss my brow, croon wildly to me, sing rock baby haul me into meat market, toss me on the scales, and cry, Watch it! Don't weigh your thumb there, butcher! Do you see how our lives move toward murder? This fool, this persecutor of my flesh and soul. As for my childhood, my parents were small people, not quite dwarfs, not quite. My father's inheritance kept us in a doll's house, an amazing thing like a white scrolled wedding cake, little rooms, little chairs, miniature paintings, cameos, ambos with insects caught inside, everything tiny, tiny, tiny. The world of giants far away, an ugly rumor beyond the garden wall. Poor Mama, Papa. They meant only the best for me. They kept me like a porcelain vase, small and treasure to themselves, in our ant world, our beehive rooms, our microscopic library, our land of beetle-sized doors and moth windows. Only now do I see the magnificent size of my parents' psychosis. They must have dreamed they would live forever, keeping me like a butterfly under glass. But first father died, and then fire ate up the little house, the wasp's nest, and every postage stamp mirror and salt cellar closet within. Mama, too, gone, and myself alone, watching the fallen embers, tossed out into a world of monsters and titans, caught in a landslide of reality, rush rolled, and smashed to the bottom of the cliff. It took me a year to adjust. A job with a sideshow was unthinkable. There seemed no place for me in the world. And then a month ago, the persecutor came into my life, clapped the bonnet on my unsuspecting head, and cried to friends, I want you to meet the little woman. Amy stopped reading. Her eyes were unsteady, and the magazine shook as she handed it to Ralph. You finish it. The rest is a murder story. It's all right. But don't you see that little man? That little man? Ralph tossed the magazine aside and lit a cigarette lazily. I like westerns better. Ralph, you got to read it. He needs someone to tell him how good he is and keep him writing. Ralph looked at her, his head to one side. And guess who's going to do it? Well, well, ain't we just a savior's right hand? I won't listen. Use your head, damn it. You go busting in on him and he'll think you're handing him pity. 
He'll chase you screaming out of his room. She sat down, thinking about it slowly, trying to turn it over and see it from every side. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Oh, it's not just pity, Ralph, honest. But maybe it looked like it to him. I've got to be awful careful. He shook her shoulder back and forth, pinching softly with his fingers. Hell, hell, lay off him is all I ask. You'll get nothing but trouble for your dough. God, Amy, I never seen you so hepped on anything. Look, you and me, let's make it a day. Take a lunch, get us some gas, and just drive on down the coast as far as we can drive. Swim, have supper, see a good show in some little town. To hell with a carnival, how about it? A damn nice day and no worries. I've been saving a couple of bucks. It's because I know he's different, she said, looking off into darkness. It's because he's something we can never be, you and me and all the rest of us here on the pier. It's so funny, so funny. Life fixed him, so he's good for nothing, but Carney shows. Yet there he is on the land, and life made us so we wouldn't have to work in the carny shows but here we are anyway way out here at sea on the pier sometimes it seems a million miles to shore how come ralph that we got the bodies but he's got the brains and can think things we'll never even guess you haven't been listening to me said ralph she sat with him standing over her his voice far away her eyes were half shut and her hands were in her lap twitching. I don't like that shrewd look you're getting on, he said finally. She opened her purse slowly and took out a small roll of bills and started counting. Thirty-five, forty dollars. There. I'm going to phone Billy Fine and have him send out one of those tall type mirrors to Mr. Bigelow at the Gangie's Arms. Yes, I am. What? Think how wonderful for him, Ralph, having one in his own room any time he wants it. Can I use your phone? Go ahead. Be nutty. Ralph turned quickly and walked off down the tunnel. A door slammed. Amy waited, then after a while put her hands to the phone and began to dial with painful slowness. She paused between numbers, holding her breath, shutting her eyes, thinking how it might seem to be small in the world, and then one day someone sends a special mirror, a mirror for your room where you can hide away with the big reflection of yourself, shining and write stories and stories, never going out into the world unless you had to. How might it be then alone, when the wonderful illusion all in one piece in the room, would it make you happy or sad? Would it help your writing or hurt it? She shook her head back and forth, back and forth. At least this way, there would be no one to look down at you. Night after night, perhaps rising secretly at three in the cold morning, you could wink and dance around and smile and wave at yourself. So tall, so tall, so very fine and tall, in the bright looking glass. A telephone voice said, Billy Fines. Oh, Billy, she cried. Night came in over the pier. The ocean lay dark and loud under the planks. Ralph sat cold and waxen in his glass coffin, laying out the cards, his eyes fixed, his mouth stiff. At his elbow, a growing pyramid of burnt cigarette butts grew larger. When Amy walked along under the hot red and blue bulbs, smiling, waving, he did not stop setting the cards down slow and very slow. Hi, Ralph, she said. How's the love affair? He asked, drinking from a dirty glass of iced water. How's Charlie Boyer, or is it Cary Grant? I just went and bought me a new hat, she said, smiling. Gosh, I feel good. You know why? Billy finds sending a mirror out tomorrow. Can't you just see the nice little guy's face? I'm not so hot at imagining. Oh, Lord, you think I was going to marry him or something? Why not? 
carry him around in a suitcase. People say, where's your husband? All you do is open your bag, yell, here he is, like a silver cornet. Take him out of his case any old hour, play a tune, stash him away, keep a little sandbox for him on the back porch. I was feeling so good, she said. Benevolent is the word. Ralph did not look at her, his mouth tight. Benevolent. I suppose this all comes from me watching him through that knot hole, getting my kicks. That why you sent the mirror? People like you run around with tambourines, taking the joy out of my life. Remind me not to come to your place for drinks any more. I'd rather go with no people at all than mean people. Ralph exhaled a deep breath. Amy, Amy, don't you know you can't help that guy? He's bats. And this crazy thing of yours is like saying, go ahead, be batty. I'll help you, pal. Once in a lifetime anyway. It's nice to make a mistake if you think it'll do somebody good, she said. God deliver me from do-gooders, Amy. Shut up, shut up, she cried, and then said nothing more. He let the silence lie a while, and then got up, putting his fingerprinted glass aside. Mind the booth for me. Sure. Why? She saw ten thousand cold white images of him stalking down the glassy corridors, between mirrors, his mouth straight, and his fingers working themselves. She sat in the booth for a full minute, and then suddenly shivered. A small clock ticked in the booth and she turned the deck of cards over one by one, waiting. She heard a hammer pounding and knocking and pounding again, far away inside the maze. A silence, more waiting, and then 10,000 images folding and refolding and dissolving, Ralph striding, looking out at 10,000 images of her in the booth. She heard his quiet laughter as he came down the ramp. Well. What's put you in such a good mood? she asked suspiciously. Amy, he said carelessly, we shouldn't quarrel. You say tomorrow Billy's sending that mirror to Mr. Biggs? You're not going to try anything funny. Me? He moved her out of the booth and took over the cards, humming his eyes bright. Not me. Oh, no, not me. He did not look at her, but started quickly to slap out the cards. She stood behind him. Her right eye began to twitch a little. She folded and unfolded her arms. A minute ticked by. The only sound was the ocean under the night pier. Ralph breathing in the heat, the soft ruffle of the cards. The sky over the pier was hot and thick with clouds. Out at sea, faint glows of lightning were beginning to show. Ralph, she said at last, relax, Amy, he said. About that trip you wanted to take down the coast. Tomorrow, he said. Maybe next month. Maybe next year. Old Ralph Banghart's a patient guy. I'm not worried, Amy. Look, he held up a hand. I'm calm. She waited for a roll of thunder at sea to fade away. I just don't want you mad is all. I just don't want anything bad to happen. Promise me. The wind, now warm, now cool, blew along the pier. There was a smell of rain in the wind. The clock ticked. Amy began to perspire heavily, watching the cards move and move. Distantly, you could hear targets being hit in the sounds of the pistols at the shooting gallery. And then, there he was, waddling along the lonely concourse, under the insect bulbs his face twisted and dark, every movement and effort. From a long way down the pier he came, with Amy watching. She wanted to say to him, This is your last night, the last time you'll have to embarrass yourself by coming here, the last time you'll have to put up with being watched by Ralph, even in secret. She wished she could cry out and laugh and say it right in front of Ralph, but she said nothing. Hello, hello, shouted Ralph. It's free on the house tonight, special for old customers. 
The dwarf looked up, startled, his little black eyes darting and swimming in confusion. His mouth formed the words thanks, and he turned, one hand to his neck, pulling his tiny lapels tight up under his convulsing throat, the other hand clenching the silver dime secretly. Looking back, he gave a little nod, and then scores of dozens of compressed and tortured faces, burnt a strange dark color by the lights, wandered in the glass corridors. Ralph, Amy took his elbow. What's going on? He grinned. I'm being benevolent, Amy. Benevolent. Ralph, she said. She said, listen. They waited in the booth in the long, warm silence. Then, a long way off, muffled, there was a scream. Ralph, said Amy. Listen, listen, he said. There was another scream, and another, and still another, and a threshing and a pounding and a breaking, a rushing around and through the maze. There, there, wildly colliding and ricocheting, from mirror to mirror, shrieking hysterically and sobbing, tears on his face, mouth gasped open, came Mr. Bigelow. He fell out in the blazing night air, glanced about wildly, wailed, and ran off down the pier. Ralph, what happened? Ralph said, laughing and slapping at his thighs. She slapped his face. What'd you do? He didn't quite stop laughing. Come on, I'll show you. And then she was in a maze, rushed from white hot mirror to mirror, seeing her lipstick all red fire a thousand times repeated on down a burning silver cavern, where strange hysterical women, much like herself, followed a quick moving, smiling man. Come on, he cried, and they broke free into a dust smelling tiny room. Ralph, she said, they both stood on the threshold of the little room where the dwarf had come every night for a year. They both stood where the dwarf had stood each night before opening his eyes to see the miraculous image in front of him. Amy shuffled slowly, one hand out, into the dim room. The mirror had been changed. This new mirror made even tall people little and dark and twisted smaller as you moved forward. And Amy stood before it thinking and thinking that if it made big people small standing here, God, what would it do to a dwarf, a tiny dwarf, a dark dwarf, a startled and lonely dwarf? She turned and almost fell. Ralph stood looking at her. Ralph, she said, God, why did you do it? Amy, come back. She ran out through the mirrors crying. Staring with blurred eyes, it was hard to find the way, but she found it. She stood blinking at the empty pier, started to run one way, then another, then stand still, then stopped. Ralph came up behind her, talking, but it was like a voice heard behind the wall late at night, remote and foreign. Don't talk to me, she said. Someone came running up the pier, it was Mr. Kelly from the shooting gallery. Hey, any you see a little guy just now? Little stiff swiped the pistol from my place. Loaded? Run off before I got a hand on him. You help me find him? And Kelly was gone, sprinting, turning his head to search between all the canvas sheds, on a way under the hot blue and red and yellow strong bulbs. Amy rocked back and forth and took a step. Amy, where are you going? She looked at Ralph as if he had just turned a corner. Strangers passing and bumped into each other. I guess, she said, I'm going to help search. You won't be able to do nothing. I got to try anyway. Oh, God, Ralph, this is all my fault. I shouldn't have phoned Billy Fine. I shouldn't have ordered a mirror and got you so mad you did this. It's me should have gone to Mr. Big, not a crazy thing like I bought. I'm going to find him if it's the last thing I ever do in my life. Swinging about slowly, her cheeks wet, she saw the quivery mirrors that stood in front of the maze. Ralph's reflection was in one of them. She could not take her eyes away from the image. 
It held her in a cool and trembling fascination with her mouth open. Amy, what's wrong? What are your... you... He sensed where she was looking and twisted about to see what was going on. His eyes widened. He scowled at the blazing mirror. A horrid, ugly little man, from the two feet high, production, with a pale, squash face under an diary. ancient straw hat no scowled means. back at him. Check under the bed Ralph sure stood there, no glaring at himself, his there. hands at his sides. Is the closet door securely Amy walked slowly and then began to walk fast and then began to run. Amp up your imagination she ran down the empty pier for another ride into and the wind blew warm. History. And, and it blew large drops of hot rain out of the sky on her all the time she was running.